This podcast is part of the Deluxe Edition Network. To find other great shows on the network, head over to deluxeeditionnetwork.com. That's deluxeeditionnetwork.com. Hello, hello, hello. It's me, Michelle, your host and pocket DJ of Coffee Fueled Stories, a show where storytelling and coffee hang out. This week's special guest is horror author Larry Hinkle. Hello, welcome to the show, Larry. Hello. Is, is it okay that I don't have coffee? Absolutely. I, We're doing I this have very a late. Lie. I had my two cups of coffee, so so we're doing a late a late show. So uh, I like that you've got the mai tai. That's totally awesome. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry. So we are going to talk about your book that just came out—a collection of short stories. Debut collection. Your debut collection. How cool is that? I I, I feel honored to be talking about your brand new baby. So thank you for the joining the show. First one too. So this is pretty cool. Woo! <laughs> So let's talk about the space between your newest baby. Tell us about that. It is, it's a collection of, of, of 20 stories. 10 of them are new and 10 are um, reprints over the course of the last, uh, I think the first one was like 2012 or 2013. So the last 10, 11 years of, of what I've been writing, it's pretty much me. I mean, there's a, there's a whole mix of stuff in there. There's, there's horror comedy, which is a lot of, a lot of the stories are funny. But there's also, there's cosmic horror, there's pulp horror, there's just weird stuff. You know, there's a drabble in there. It's a hundred words, but takes up a whole page. So you got to increase, increase that page count. So. It, it does. And you are in advertising by day. Yes. So you kind of make a reference to that in, in regard to having your conciseness, right? Because that's that's the whole point of, of advertising, right? Is to make it short and sweet to, to get yeah, people to want the product, right? It's kind of a problem for me that I just write so short that, that I haven't written anything longer than 5,700 words. And that's, I mean... It's 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 hard for me to write. It's hard for me to write longer than that. That's why most of my stories are, you know, I mean, when I started writing, I was only writing flash. So everything was around a thousand words. I've slowly got up to where my stories are usually now around 3000, 4000 words. It's hard for me to get to that point, especially the way I write, because I usually will write all my um, all my dialogue first, which is just which is I people in my writing group think that's the strangest thing. But I mean, when you when you write advertising, so much of it, especially radio spots, which I which I write the majority of my my work is is dialogue. So I'm just really comfortable with writing dialogue. So my first drafts are just like dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Then I just start going in and filling in shit as I go along. Oh, stuff. Can I cuss? Yes, Sorry. you can. Yes, okay. you can. It's fine. Yeah. So see, you, I needed someone like you. Uh, in, in my former life, I did training videos. So SOPs, we talked about SOPs. So standard operating procedures. And I did training videos. They wanted me to write the scripts for the training videos. Uh. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't do it, Larry, because I was so focused on the process. I'm like, look, I know how this is to be done. I wrote the SOP on it. So all I know is point A to point B, point C to point D. I'm like, you want me to put words in there? And I can't, I don't, and they wanted me to be their script writer so many times. And they're like, but you know, the process. And I'm like, but I'm, uh, I, I can't, my brain doesn't, <laughs> my brain doesn't do that. I'm like, my day job is this. And at nighttime is when I'm creative. And that's when I write horror and bloody and flash. So I, I get exactly what you're saying. They they wanted me to do something that my brain just wouldn't allow me to do. It's rough because you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow writer to begin with. And when I spend, you know, eight, 10 hours a day writing anyway, there's a, there goes time that I can go two or three months without writing anything. You know, I just, you just get burnt out. Yeah. Writing. All, which it sounds like a, I wish I could write all the time. No, you don't. You know, I, there's there's many the day I wish I was just like a manual laborer. You know, and then yeah. then I wouldn't feel so. Then I could come home and say, "Oh, now I'm going to write." Instead of I'm writing, oh, now I'm going to write some more. Oh, it's, it's it, a lot of writing. It is, and I don't know about you. This so when I have like my most creative moments, 
is usually when I'm cleaning the dishes or taking a shower. And it's because I'm doing a mundane task and my brain has the ability to just start getting creative. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly, you know, kind of to the point that we're talking about when you're so focused on being creative, sometimes you just have to put the pause button on and just say, you know what, I I need to fill my brain with some mundane shit uh, so that I can be creative again. I do a lot of thinking when I'm, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm bike riding, I used to do a lot when we lived in um, Omaha, we still owned a little vacation cottage up in the mountains in Colorado for what we bought when we lived in Denver. And I would go back to the cottage every six weeks, every eight weeks or so. And I was about an eight and a half hour drive. I love to drive. And so I would, um, I do a lot of my story plotting then, you know, cause you're just, you just, you just zone out when you're driving and it's, it's awesome. That's where I got the, the idea for the story. Um, the space between that the book is the, yes. the title story in the book that came to me when I was up, uh, I was actually driving, you know, back and forth from from Omaha to Idaho Springs, Colorado, and I was listening to Pseudopod. And um, my, Michael Wehunt had a story um, in his first collection, Greener Pastures, that they did. That kind of it was a guy at a truck stop, and it was just a phenomenal story. And that got my brain going just about how big the open space is between. Because once you get past Lincoln, there's nothing until you pretty much hit Denver. You know, and it's it's just there's little towns here, you know, but it's crazy how much of the country there is just nobody in and nothing in and what could be going on in those spaces. That's where I got the idea that maybe realities were overlapping in spaces like that It made it easy to cross back and forth. So, yeah, that was a great story. So so thank you for bringing up your book, because now we're going to start talking about (laughs) this. (laughs) Okay, as as you were saying. I'm in for a treat and I don't know where we're going with this based off of your, (laughs) the early praise quotes. Right. And then when I was reading um, like, and we, we messaged about this and I laughed hysterically when uh, your mom, you had your mom's praise quote in there. I thought that was brilliant. That that was, that that was actually written um, posthumously. Uh, My mom, Um, she passed away at the end of July last summer. So it sucks that she never got to actually see oh. my book because she was the one who got me into horror at a way, way too early age. Um, I mean, she knew I signed the contract and she's read everything in the book, but she never got, she actually got to hold it in her oh, hand. Oh, I'm sorry. I remember she, her, you know, we, we went to, I can remember going to the, to the drive-in when I was a kid and it was, it was like a, you know, it was all night horror things. And the last movie of, of the evening was Night of the Living Dead, which is, it's, it's now my favorite, my favorite movie, but there were people, you know, and I was probably, my brother was there, my sister wasn't there. So I would, she was five years, I would have had to be in like six or seven seeing this movie. And I, people were in, 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 you know, in, in the drive-in dressed like zombies going through the crowd banging on cars and shit and it was oh, no awesome oh my god you okay just see halloween in the theater and, and everything i remember one time i was in middle school and they were showing um they were showing alien on hbo and i i, I talked her and letting me stay home for the day so i could watch it you know and <laughs> she, she so yeah she was the one who got me reading stephen king and all the all of that so it was it sucks that she's not here for it, but yeah i i had to give it a quote from her in there. Yeah, and I, I, she had she had said that. I didn't just didn't like make that up out of whole cloth. <laughs> she had said that you know, she dropped me on my head before. So <laughs> that's awesome. And and your virtual background is is Night of the Living Dead. <laughs> What's awesome is my mom uh, too. That was one of her favorite movies. And every time at Halloween time when they they play it, the first thing we start doing before we like tune into the show. Is we the two of us would go, they're coming to get you, Barbara. My mom's name is Barbara, so oh no, way. I made it even better. Oh, that's awesome. That's that's and, one of the, every every well in October I do I watch a different horror movie every night, you know, then post about oh, it. But yeah. on Halloween night I'll do three, and the, the the last movie of the night is always Night of the Living Dead. Have you noticed how Coffee Fueled Stories doesn't have any ads? That's because I work tirelessly to keep this show alive. After three years on my own, I've decided I need to ask for your help. I've never asked anyone to subscribe. I've never asked anyone to leave a review. I've never asked anyone to rate the show. And I've never asked anyone to pay to listen. 
there are a few ways you can help support the show. I've created a Patreon page, Coffee Field Stories, and a subscription section on my podcast website. It's simple to support and help me keep my dream alive. Just click the link in the show notes to set up your paid subscription option. It's that easy. Thank you for your support. It's pure. It's perfect. And and I'm sure we could probably have a whole episode on that oh, alone. I, that's why I can use five I can hours read dialogue on you. It's just it's just so good. Uh, so since we're talking about Halloween and and we're we're in that vein, let's go with this. Have you ever been in a corn maze? I was. I went in one a couple of years ago, but it was after I wrote this story. So I was actually pretty pleased that I got it so well. The only thing I didn't pick up on, I guess, was that the wind the wind was louder than I thought it was going to be. But yeah, I, I'd always wanted to go to one, but I just had never got around to it. It's like, it's the same thing with, with with haunted houses. I'd never been to one until this fall. We finally went. It was so cool too, because it had like, the first part of it was just like this little warehouse thing that you walk through. I was like, yeah, that's okay. But then the next half was like a mile long trip through the woods and they had all these stations set up and that was really cool. Oh, but no, I'd, never, I'd never been in a corn maze before I wrote that story. That's crazy. I, I've never been in a corn maze. So I, I was taking your, you know, words for it. And especially I like how you had like, they were all sweaty. And so like some of the ta- and you, tassels, I didn't know what those were called, you know, with like the little Ugh. pieces that get stuck. And I was like, I can, I'm like, I'm there. I can, I can feel it. Like I can hear it, you know, and, you know, and my, dirt. My, my wife grew up in Indiana. So she was able to, 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 to check me. She goes, yeah, that, that sounds about right. You know, I think you got that part right. Nice. <laughs> I went through um, that story and let me think, let me go through this in my head here. That story, the the space between the title story, Lost at Last, and The Tunnel at the End of the Light, all four of those have um, are connected. So I don't know, if you go through and pay attention, you'll see that, that's, that those four stories are all part of a like a shared universe thing. That's my next challenge is I want to write a novella with characters from those four stories. Cool. But that's obviously longer than 5,700 words. So it's pretty intimidating. Okay. I, I, I was, I was joking. I, I wrote an outline for it earlier this year, <laughs> but I went back later and read it. I was like, this, this might make a good story. This could be pretty cool. <laughs> so, so we'll see. So if people want to read, if people buy my book and read all four of those stories, they're like, wow, maybe I want to read a story with all of these people in it. Or maybe they don't, you know, but I, I'm still going to write it because that's, I just write to make myself laugh. So after I read Fresh, I just, I laughed and I couldn't believe it. It cracked me up. It really did. And let me ask you about this. Are you a germaphobe? Like, no, it, it, no, no I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the five second rule. You know, that, that shit can hit the floor. And if I pick it up in five seconds, it's going to my mouth. It's fine. I, was, I have dogs, you know, so you can't be a germaphobe with, with dogs. Oh, my God. I was cracking up because I, I can really. So maybe it's because as a woman, like using public restrooms just really sucks, Larry. Like it, it oh, really does. You don't want to touch anything. And so I have what's known as the elbow maneuver. And so you, you know, open the door. So I could really relate to your character is what I'm getting at. I, I could see myself having that, like I'm in a public bathroom and there's no paper towels. And I'm just like, this sucks. Yeah, it's just kind of gross, but related. I, one agency job, I, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and I worked, you know, worked at several ad, ad agencies there. And one of them, all the girls who worked there said there was someone in the age, in the agency, they called the, the phantom sprayer. Oh no! Not sit on the actual toilet seat. <laughs> and so they, they would. My my partner Michelle, you know, she was the art director and I was the copywriter. She would come in. She goes, "Oh my god, I hate the fam sprayer," you know. And just it was just always everyone was going off. They never did figure out who it was, but it was just okay, we didn't I, have that problem. Obviously, we got a urinal. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. I'm so glad you said this because I wanted to do a whole episode on this just by myself. I was going to do a public service announcement about this. And I'd be like, look, ladies, we have to use our, our legs a lot. So you hover, right? So I get it. Here's the <laughs> thing. Wipe your own mess. Yes. If you make a mess. Just clean wipe, it. Clean it. Not it's that yours. Hard. I don't want to have to look at it. I don't want to <laughs> see it. Like, just clean it. Like, be respectful. Like. But just clean your, yeah, just clean your mess. So anyway. If you don't want to sit in someone else's pee, don't make someone sit in your pee. Number one rule. 
we take anything from this episode, that's the thing I want readers to remember. So Don't make gonna, someone spit in your pee unless I they know. want to, because I'm not going to kink shame someone. You know what? That's a that's something for another show. <laughs> Completely. No, we've, really, we've really, really, really went off the rail. Man, <laughs> that's, that's a topic for a completely different show. <laughs> so getting us back to your your stories. Yes. Um, <laughs> did you ever have an invisible friend as a kid growing up? You know, my mom says I did, or she she said I did. Um, I don't remember it, but she said I had a, an invisible friend I talked about and played with all the time. And I think, you know, I mean, kids are creepy. And especially when you see them talking to something that's not there. It's like the same thing with like with dogs, with like your dog and your cat will sit there and, and stare at shit that you're looking and you're like, there ain't, there's nothing there. What are you staring at? Yeah. And I know that, that, that they can see things that, that we can't see. And I think kids are the same way because they're, you know, their brains haven't like become really human brains yet. So they, so I don't, so that's that, that idea just always fascinated me. And it's funny that that story actually, I mean, several years ago, I took um, a lit reactor class. Brian Keene was one of the instructors and the, 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 the assignment he gave us that week was he wanted us to write the origin story of a, of a um, well-known horror character. So this story started out as the origin story for the boogeyman from Stephen King's story, The Boogeyman. And, 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 and Brian didn't get that. He's like, this is really good, but who's, and I said, it's the boogeyman, man. He, yeah, I didn't get that at all, man. But he says, but keep this part, keep the opening and keep working on it. And there's something there. And I kept worrying, you know, you know, a few years later, I, I mean, that, that made in what, 2022, it made the preliminary ballot for the, for the Soaker Awards. That so that was so pretty cool. cool. And I, last year at AuthorCon, I gave him a copy of Dark Recesses, the, the publication that was in. I was like, so you, you know, you probably don't remember this at all, but this story came from, you know, your, your writing prompt. And I mean, I, I put little clues in there now, if you read it, like one, at one point, like the, 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 the dad says like, you know, once you change, you're really going to boogie, man, you know? And yeah. Just, yeah. Just I saw that, like yeah. That. Like if you get, I, I, another, another old partner of mine, Chad, he was an art director and agency I worked at in Colorado Springs. I haven't talked to him in a while. And um, he sent me a message Saturday night. He just got the book. And he's like, man, I need to talk to you about that story. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so (laughs) it's a great story. It is, it is. On that note, okay, I don't know about you, but like, so I just looked at the closet doors. Dude, closet doors always closed. Still to this day. At least, (laughs) yeah. And my closet doors always closed. My wife's closet door has so many shoes and shit in it that half the time you can't get it closed. So I just like, I I sleep with the covers over my head. Right? (laughs) Don't, don't. The feet don't go over the bed. <laughs> no, I just like put, I put the covers over my head. I have a little. Usually, I have a little earphone in my ear because I, I listen to music or podcasts at night when I'm going to sleep. But yeah, I don't, I don't need to see an open closet door when I'm mm-hmm. sleeping. Wait, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. my wife got me a, a small one like that, so now I have it sitting on the dresser. So I have a little night light at night that I nice. leave on all night. <laughs> Even though my head's under the cover, I still need a night light on. We have night lights in our bathrooms. So, you know, because the last thing you want to do when you get up in the middle of the night to have to go to the bathroom is, you know, turn on that big blinding light, right? So Ugh. we actually have night lights in our bathrooms that are, you know, dusk dawn. So it's it's on at night and off during the day. Um, but yeah, same thing. So so we have night lights too. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with yeah, that. I'm a 59 year or 58. I'll be 59 in June, but I'm a 58 year old grown ass man and I have a nightlight. Same here. 53. <laughs> I'm going to be 54. I'm right behind you. Uh, so on that note, uh, since you were talking about the writing, I wanted to actually ask you about the, you've done a couple of like boot camps and uh, you did the Crystal Lake Entertainment Authors yeah, Journey. Yeah, the Crystal Lake Authors Journey, right? That was a, a several weeks program that you got paired up with, um, an editor and they gave you assignments every week. I, I did, I did that one. I did, I mean, I did the borderlands boot camp before that thing, you know, uh, that was, that whole thing turned into a mess before she, Brian and Mary took it over. So it's all, it's all good now, but that it was really good. Uh, you know, but the bet, the best writing thing I ever took was, um was Fright Club, which uh, Mona Lawrence teaches. He used to do it through the H- HWA. Um, I think now, now I think now it's just through, through himself but that is a phenomenal 
phenomenal course. HWA members get a, a good a good price break on on the tuition for it, but it's it's a ten week course, and every week you are writing a two thousand word story. Oh wow! And so I mean, you just you are just pounding out stuff, and then you have to you have to review two people's stories, and two people review your story, and it it alternates every every week who you're reviewing, who's reviewing you. And he gives you the category, you know, or the topic. And um, every week you have a meeting and he'll go over like a whole bunch of background on why he chose this story. And then you have to write something. Wow, that is and, so cool. And there were several stories in my book that came from, you know, that were Fright Club assignments. Like one, like one of the ones, like, um, can you dig it about, about the haunted shovel? Yeah. But we were supposed to write a story about a haunted object. And he put me on the spot in class. He's like, well, Larry, what's your object? What are you writing this week? And I just like, fuck, um, a shovel, <laughs> you know, I said, that could change. It's going to be a shovel though. It's okay. It's going to be a shovel. And so I, I wrote a story about a haunted shovel. Yeah. It, yeah. It no, th these stories are great. Things I've always wondered about writers is where do you guys come up with these ideas? I would love to be able to write a novel. I don't know if I ever will, um, <laughs> but I, I'm like you, I love flash. I love, there's something I can talk for an hour about something, but when I write it's, it's so succinct. It's so weird how I'm, again, I, I, there's something about how I'm wired, I would say. Like for me, I love being efficient with words, but I love talking for about an hour about being efficient with words. <laughs> Two people in my writer group are um, Tom Deedy. He won, he won the, um, the Stoker for best first novel a few years ago. And then Krista Carmen, her debut novel is out right now. And it's nominated for Stoker for, for um, best novel, uh, The Daughters of Block Island. Tom's was Haven. Both is great, great books. But they can just write pages of something that I would just write a sentence. You know, I was like, how do you guys do that? How do you just keep, and just write and write and write. And I would just like, you know, he got a glass of water and they'll just like, right, right. And it's like, I just, I can't, my brain just doesn't work that way. Yeah. I wish it did. Cause I would love to, I'd love to be able to write a novel because there's, there's no money in short stories. You know, that's, that's, that's not something, you know, you're going to, you're going to retire on, but. We're going to make it so though, because <laughs> I, here's the thing. I love short stories because short stories take true talent. You need to know when to get in and when to get out with novels, like we were saying, right? Like novels, you have the luxury of taking eight pages to describe drinking a glass of water and characters talking about having that glass of water. But with a short story, it's all about that glass of water, right? It's yeah. just, you get in, you get out. But I have a soft spot for short stories. <laughs> I, I I always have. I mean, I mean, you know, Stephen King is everyone's favorite writer, but I think he's I think he's a better short story writer than he is a novelist. I like his novels, obviously, but I I think I th it's the same. My other my second favorite writer is Neil Gaiman, and I love his short stories more than I love his novels. He wrote one. It was, it was just for an online magazine a couple of years ago for Halloween. It was called uh, Click Clack the Rattle Bag. It's actually in his uh, his uh, Fragile Things collection, and it's a piece of flash. It's like fifteen hundred words long, and it's it's fucking. Scary scary you know and it's like it's like holy shit it's it's and it yeah uh, that, that's one I, I actually have a note in at the back of one of my stories my my friend Rebecca I had written the story um you know and and the guy dies at the end of it and she was like you can't write a story where the person dies at the end of it if it's in first person and I well Neil Gaiman did it and her response was well you're not Neil Gaiman <laughs> I said you're right I'm not <laughs> but I'm still writing this story where the person dies Thank you, because that's another thing. I don't know about you, but I, I've got a feeling you, you probably dig punk rock, right? Some, you, yeah. And you can do whatever the fuck you want. It's your story, and you can you can do it. And it's funny, because that was my first thought, like, when I read that about Rebecca, you can't do that, it's first person. Like, And I just laughed, and I was like, Larry can do whatever he wants. It's his story. <laughs> it's, 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 it's my, my, my friend. Um, I'm sorry, I, I get a stammer when I, when I talk. Um, it's all good. Bridget Nelson, she has a lot of stories where her main character dies. It's turn, told in first person and they die. And I, I, was, I asked her, I was like, all your first person characters die. Has anyone ever said anything to you about that? She's like, no. I was, so, well, maybe, maybe Rebecca's just weird. Maybe it doesn't bother anyone but Rebecca, you know?
So, so I quit worrying about it. If my first person care person's going to die, I mean, I can, you can only do it in present tense. I mean, you can't do it in past tense yeah. because, but if you're doing it in present tense, I, I think you can do it. I think the bar has been set and, and I don't have a problem with doing it anymore. That's awesome. And like, <laughs> and, and this, this is the beauty of writing. And, and, and that's where I love like flash. Like the very first time I learned about horror flash, I lost my mind and it was in my horror lit class in, in undergrad. And I was like, this is a genre. Like we actually had to write flash to turn in, mm. to get graded. And I had so much fun writing flash or it was the best thing ever. I think I wrote like eight, I like top, my brain just went, Oh my God, I can be efficient with words and gross. Awesome. Yeah. That, it's, it's <laughs> what it's, it's something I, you know, they're not around anymore, but um, I always wanted to get a story in daily science fiction. It's funny because I sent them a story right when I first started writing years ago, and it was only it was only a drabble. It was a hundred words long, and then I got a personal letter back from the editor saying, you know, it's just it's just not quite right for us, but this is really good. Blah 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 blah. And I thought, well, fuck, this is easy. And then I, it took me eighteen months till I sold anything. You know, I was totally. like, ah, oh, dang it, it was so close. But I never I never did get to sell anything to them. That was that was a bucket list. I mean, they were a bucket list, but they're they're not around. Pseudopod, which I mentioned earlier, is a huge bucket list. Um, Catterwall, the story about the garden gnome that's in here. They actually they turned that down, but they turned it down in the nicest way because they said they they said this story, um, we're gonna turn it down because it is just the interrogation scene is ridiculously over the top. But we mean that in the nicest way possible. <laughs> so I thought, love okay, I can take that. I should make that on a t-shirt or something. Yes, you know? absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. The, and you have to admit, having positive feedback, even if it's negative, is still like, I don't know, gratifying, I guess. Um, the first time I ever entered a contest, I had no idea what I was doing. It was a short story I'd written for undergrad and my professor really liked it. And he was like, you should you know, enter this in a contest. And I was like, okay. And so I finally did, I finally got up the courage. It took me like three years to do it. And I finally did it. And I got the, you know, it was rejected, but it was the nicest rejection. And I was <laughs> like, okay. And I showed it to my mentor writer and he was like, you realize this is the nicest rejection. Right. And I was like, I have no idea. And he said, you know, it was like, like please keep submitting. This was a great story. Unfortunately, it's just not what we're looking for. And he was like, that's a nice rejection. They could have just said, no, thanks. And just sent you a letter, but they hand wrote, you know, on there. And I was like, Oh, okay. I, I think I might still have, that was my first rejection. Like Stephen <sighs> King, you know, how he said he has like the nail with like all of the rejections. I don't have that. <laughs> I, ha I have a, a f I don't have, a, well, I've got them all, I guess since it's all electronic now, I've got all the rejections in a folder in my Gmail, but I've got an actual physical folder with all the rejection letters I got from every advertising job that ever turned me down. Oh, I, wow. I think, I think that the total, that the folder is, is, is titled like, you know, dumbass fuckers or something like that. So I, I don't know, but I, you know, I used to, I would hold grudges about things like that. I, I don't anymore, but I was young and stupid. You know, again, this goes back to being punk rock. So <laughs> you do what you want, Larry. You do what yeah. you want. So what I'd like to do is talk some more about some of your stories, because I do have some questions about some of the things in your story. And I wanted to ask you, so you have grilled cheese sandwiches a couple times in your stories. I love grilled cheese sandwiches. I do too. You were making me want a grilled cheese sandwich. So I need to ask you, do you use butter or mayonnaise? mayonnaise okay yes and I, how, how many slices of cheese do you use so you can pull it apart <laughs> uh, i will usually use at least three yes like like if i if, if, if we have like a pepper jack and cheddar i'll put like two pepper jacks and a piece of cheddar in there yeah. but sometimes more but my my wife likes them better with 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 butter so if I'm making them for her, I have to use the butter. But if it's just for me, and then I found out recently there was it was um I think it was in the Washington Post about how to make them in the air fryer. What? And it, it was so crispy in the air fryer. Oh my, oh god. my god! It was. It was. I forget the. Ah, I forget the temperature you set it at. But it's. It's. Yeah, you just make it like a normal one. You put it in there. You stick it in the air fryer, and everything is like oh, it's so good. But you have to actually have to let it sit for a couple of minutes because it's so hot. It's gonna be like lava. Yeah. Oh, it's phenomenal. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm. I intentionally did not eat before we talked because I knew that I was gonna get hungry when we spoke tonight. <laughs> so I'm gonna go make myself a grilled cheese sandwich for uh, for dinner. I, th I think that was um. 
in 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 well in 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 lost and it was a tunnel at the end of the light that was you know, that was a story that one is oh my gosh at least 80 80 percent of that story is autobiographical yeah it, it is about about a real writer's retreat i went to with stanley yeah and i just lost my my dog coco who i'd had since she was a puppy she was like 18 years old and I was, I, you know, I was, I was going through a rough patch. I mean, part of the, the part obviously about, about being haunted by her ghost is, is, is not, maybe not true. I'm not, maybe it is, I don't know. But, but someone there told me like, um, if you, because everything is so expensive at the Stanley, they said, just ask for the kids menu and you can get like a grilled cheese and French fries for like six bucks. So that's all I ate the entire time I was there was I would just go in. I would say, it's like, I want an IPA, a grilled cheese and French fries off the kids menu. There's it, nothing wrong with that. There's no, absolutely wait. nothing wrong with that. So now with regard to, since we're on the topic of food, because, you know, mm. like we're, we're just going to go with that real quick. The Halloween can I'm not, we're not going to spoil anything about that story. Okay, so I'm just going to ask you about Halloween candy. What is your favorite Halloween candy? Well, my, I mean, it's it's Reese's. Yeah. You know, al- although I will say Reese's is my favorite candy, but the one, the special ones they make for different seasons are better than just the Reese's cups because they have a better peanut butter to chocolate ratio. And it's it, even though it's funny, it's, it's, it's like, who who was it? Um. Was it? The, I mean, the Beastie Boys used to have a funny song called "Cookie Puss." It was about the the caramel ice cream cakes they would make. And, and I read an article. Someone was talking about all they would do with this every every season. He would just turn the cake a different direction and then redecorate it and say, "Oh, look! Now it's a leprechaun. Oh, now it's an Easter bunny." Blah 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 blah. And sometimes when I pull like those special Reese's out of the package, I'm like, "That's not a Christmas tree. It's a fucking pumpkin. It's the same thing every year. They all look the same, but they're all delicious." Have, did you try the Franken cup this year for or last year for Halloween? I got a Franken cup. It's got the green on it, so no. like it's half and half. It wasn't the best, but you know what? It, it was. It said Franken cup, and it was Halloween, so I got it and I ate it. I'm weird about things like that. I don't want to. I might. I might have it and hate it, and it would turn me off Reese's cups. Well, I also stuck it in the freezer, so it it was a really hard. It wasn't as yeah. smooth and as creamy as I probably I probably should not have put it in the freezer. But Payday, that's, Payday that's my really mistake. Good. Paydays yeah. are really good Halloween candy too. Those are those are a good road snack. Paydays yes. and um, cherry pies are good yeah. when you're driving. Yeah, and you actually like those little things that everyone hates. They're the little um, like the peanut butter hard taffy that come in like the black and orange wrappers. For Halloween, that like old people give out. Oh, I don't know what they're those? called, but they're just like there's like little pieces of like just like bleh in in like an orange wrapper and a black wrapper. And I would always take those from like my oh. brother and sister. I thought oh, those yeah. things are great. I love oh, those. Oh yeah, things. those are so old school. That's so old school. Oh my god, that that but, is also a favorite. <laughs> I love Halloween f- for so many reasons, but so usually I don't know about you, but I I try not to eat a lot of candy throughout the year. And then that's yeah. right. I try. And the then I say, though, was not to buy it. <laughs> yes. And, and that's what I do. I try not to buy it. So I, I do my best to not buy it throughout the year so that at Halloween time, I give myself that one month to just really enjoy uh, candy. You know, that's, that's, that is the, that, I mean, I, I, I don't like Christmas in the least. And I, I think a lot of that is because um, I work, I worked retail for six years and and that that actually comes into that the the the, the Santa Claus story the Santa Advent I can never say that Santa Advent Killer yes I I hate there's no such thing as the Christmas spirit that's all bullshit you know people say there's Christmas spirit but when you're working like the retail counter and you don't have the toy that they want for little Jimmy they will just ream your ass so quickly and it just it just it turned me off from the I I hate it now. But Halloween is my favorite. Halloween's the only holiday I really celebrate. I mean, I love yeah. Halloween so and, much. I, it's, the only, that, it's the only time of the year I want to see kids. I get upset if we don't have kids to come to the house. Like during the pandemic, it killed me oh. because it was no. We we made little um bags that I I actually drew 
on each of the candy bag. I drew little illustrations like a uh, scarecrows and haunted house and graveyards. And then we just set them on a table at the end of our driveway. And Aww. I was sitting in the window and look, I thought, oh, a kid just picked up our little bag of candy. Nice. But, but I, I love, I love kids on Halloween. <laughs> right. But see, this is what's really cool. And this, we have the horror community to thank for this. Now Christmas can be spooky. You can have a black tree with skull ornaments. Like they make all this stuff now. And it's uh -huh. like, thank you for, to us who love Halloween all year round. We, we believe that Halloween is not one month long. It's every day and we love it and we live it. And now Christmas can be spooky. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you. I got, I got, um, two, two, two years ago, we got the big 12 foot floating witch at, at Home Depot. And then last year I got the 12 foot skelly, the big, huge skeleton. And I wanted to leave him up all year round. I just decorated, but, it, but, but, but my wife wasn't fond of that idea. So he's, he's back in the shed now. <laughs> so your, the story that I was struggling with the name too, the Sant Advance. Advent. Killer, advent yeah. yes advent because it's an advent calendar and this dude is killing santa clauses right so right. one of my favorite things is portmanteau like i love the word portmanteau <laughs> and i love to make portmanteaus like i think portmanteaus are like so fun do you have any favorite words like is portmanteau one of your favorite words or do you love to make portmanteaus as well well that's you know i do but i can't think any of it off the top of my head but it's always fun to make those Right. I, we would make them, I mean, years and years ago, this is probably like 2003, 2004. I used to write, um, I used to do recaps for this, this, this uh, big TV website at the time. It's called TV Gasm. And we, we were at the time, we were like one of Entertainment Weekly's top 25 entertainment sites of the, of, of the year. Um, but we would always make those for the different characters where you're combining them, you know, and those yeah. are, those are always fun. I mean, I, there's a lot of, I mean, I love the word, I love the word bamboozle. I love the word shenanigans. That's another fun one. Like my dogs are always doing shenanigans and they're trying to bamboozle us. I just, just, just weird sounding words like that are just, are just fun to me. And I always try to slip them in the ads as often as I can. Now, I don't know if you can talk about like any of the stuff that you've done, but like, is there like a particular ad that like, has it been your favorite or like? Obviously there's always going to be your, your favorite ones. I think favorite ad i've ever done and this was this was years and years and years ago it was for a bank where um the it was for this is it was so weird the guy decided he wanted to do a print ad about a mouse in a maze the the the, the, the client made us do this but he said now i want that as a radio spot I'm like, how the fuck am I going to write a radio spot about a mouse in a maze? So I ended up writing this one where it was this guy dreaming that he was a mouse in a maze. And he ran into Sigmund Freud in the, in the maze and everything. And that, that thing ended up actually winning, um, winning a national in the New York Festival of Advertising. No it ended way. Up winning an award for that. It was, it was, it was just like one guy speaking monotone really, really fast. You know, so I probably, you, usually like at a 60 second spot, you want to have, on average, 160 to 170 words. And I probably had 200, 220 words in the spot. And we had him like, we, we, we'd have him record it until he ran out of breath. Then he would take a big breath and keep, and we, we just edit out the breath, you know? Yeah. So it just sounded like it was 60 seconds of nonstop talking. So awesome. I, I, mean, I, I can, I can, I can re recite probably half of that ad still from memory. And that was, oh my God, that was almost, oh my God, was it? that would have been in the late, Midnight, Jesus, that was 30 years ago. Holy oh, shit, I'm holy fucking God. old. I've been doing this shit a long time. <laughs> no, you know, I had another one that I did. This is this, this, I, I that it was funny because I was interviewing a, a really good friend of mine now. I was interviewing for her first copywriting job, and I had just started at this agency, and and she didn't, she didn't know that. And I asked her during the interview, I was like, um. You know what? I, you know you always ask her what are some ads you like. You know she told us so what are ads you some ads you don't like, and she described this billboard that was near it was near the hospital on three fifteen in Columbus. And I was like, oh, I did that billboard. Yes. I just did that at the last. I've only worked a couple of months. I did that at my last agent because she thought she was all all safe. Like I'm not going to say anything that this agency did that I hate. 
I'll say something some other agency did. That's, yeah, I did that billboard. You know, so, so, so we still hired her, and now we're best friends. So that's but that was awesome. that was kind of so now. Okay, this this goes to so here's here's going to be we're actually going to get some writing questions in here. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, we I have know. had some writing I questions. I tend to ramble. No, 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 no. It's all good. The whole point of this is to be a conversation, not to mm. be an interview. So, but I do need to hit some writing questions in order to be a, writing, a writing podcast. podcast. Yes. You lose your podcast card otherwise. Right. So did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Yes, I did. However, and this is, this is like the shittiest thing that's ever happened in my life was that I, I went to college at the Ohio State University because it's the best college in the world, despite what my wife will tell you that Indiana is better, but it's not. I took a, you know, I took a creative writing course there and it was, the, 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 the class was set up in the same style that Borderlands was set up where basically everyone turns their stories in anonymously and then you, you critique the story, but actually, I guess it wasn't anonymously. You, you critique the story, but... The person who wrote the story is not allowed to defend themselves. So basically you sit there for, you know, half an hour, everyone telling you what a shitty writer you are, and you can't say a word in your defense. And I got beat up so badly in this class that I quit. Oh. I mean, this was, this would have been when I would, cause I meant when I graduated when I was 21, so this would have been when I was like, I was 20. Um, and I didn't start writing again until about 10, 12 years ago. So I would have been 40. So yeah, I, I quit for 30 some years. Wow. I just, I just quit writing. Um, oh. And I got, you know, being in advertising, 99% of the stuff you write doesn't get produced. Either, either you kill it, your creative director kills it, or the client kills it until they pick oh. one idea to do. So I just developed a much thicker skin over the years. And finally, I don't know, I don't know why. Just one day, this it was, it was for um, I forget which I forget which story it was, it was even that I did, but just the idea came to my head and I just sat down and started writing it, you know, and it, that was the first thing I'd written in forever. Wow. And I just I've been writing, I've been writing since then. I mean, I, I wrote a I wrote a story um. It might have been in, in, in like the last issue of, of Sanitarium, which was which is it was cool. It was a, it was a, a British monthly uh, publication that I I it was, it was so funny. It was me and um, Gwendolyn Keist and Scarlett Algae, who's the managing editor for Journal Stone and Trepidatio, and like Lee Foreman, who does the Sirens Call, and uh, Brooklyn Wara, who's one of Shirley Jackson. We all read Slush. You know, we were all just starting out together. We were all read Slush together. And I wrote a story for the last issue of that magazine. I think it was, it, and it was all about some guy who who like got beat up in college and quit writing. So I, I was making up names that they called him in, in class. Like I, I said, they called me Fraud Serling, and they said I wrote tales from the crap. But it, it was terrible. It was so demoralizing. And I, I wish you know that I would have had. I just would have had the the guts to not quit. I mean, I, I, it, I probably would have sucked for years and years and years because it's, it's only been in the past four or five years that I think I've gotten where I can consistently put out a good story instead of like a lot of shit like I was when I first started. But, you know, just all those wasted years and I didn't do anything. Oh, man. I, was, I, 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 I told myself, and it, it, to, a, to a big extent, it was true that I was scratching that itch writing advertising. And, and maybe maybe I started writing again because I was just getting tired of writing advertising. I don't know, but now it's just it, I've always wanted to be a writer. Yes, that was that was the answer. But but I didn't for a long time because I was a wuss and quit. See, I'm going to defend you. I'm going to say you weren't a wuss. So again, this kind of goes back to you know Christmas being spooky. Like thank you, you know horror community for doing that. I think you know back because I'm right behind you in age. So you and I, you know, have the same time frame. I know that like now a lot of things aren't a stigma. You can be, okay, I'll give you this example. I used to wear all black every day in school. And I used to get the infamous, you know, whose funeral are you going to? And then oh. I would just deadpan response, yours. Yeah. Right. So I was the freak. I, I would say your mom's. <laughs> right, but, but we were the freaky kids right we were the ones that oh, people yeah. just didn't understand us we just didn't quite fit in because we weren't you know the popular jocks or or, or whatnot yeah. and so but now you know you, like 
So we had to get all of that crap. We, so in other words, you're welcome to the younger generation, right? Yeah. Because we were the ones that, like you said, we didn't stop. Larry, I didn't create the podcast until literally three years ago. I was 51 years old when I created my podcast. Why? My mom didn't want me to be a radio DJ. I wanted to be a radio DJ. I thought I had a, a nice DJ voice. I was very much into music. I thought I would be a great interviewer or radio personality. And my mom was like, no, you're going to get a real job. So 30 years later, I finally was like, you know what? I want to do what I want to do, mommy. And here I am with my platform talking about horror and writing. There you go. It, it all comes full circle. Now she yeah, did introduce me to horror, out. right? So same thing, like the, it, it all relates, but we, in other words, the fact that you didn't give up. So this is what I'm getting at. This is why I'm defending you. The fact that you didn't give up, you're like, God damn it. This is something that I really want to do. I feel passionate about it. And that's why we're here to support you, Larry. So please keep doing these stories because my feedback, like I said, I was reading your stories and I was like, good God. Oh my God, please keep writing this stuff because it just, okay. Your ax body spray, com like uh, I, you know, was the trash box <laughs> I was laughing hysterically because I, you even mentioned like sage, there's sage in there. And then like, like some other, and I was like, ingredients. I'm like, that damn, was, he, he got really into that ax body spray. That was another, um, another fright club story. That was our kaiju assignment. I was like, you know, I, was like, well, I just wanted to do something, some, you know, not just a big, big animal. So I just made a 90 foot sentient garbage dump. And so. it was hilarious. <laughs> it was, like I said, you're the story ideas that you can, again, and the fact that you're doing this so late and then, you know, and you're just still tap, you're tapping into, you know, your, your, you, I mean, in, in a way you are tapping into your youth. I, all I have to say is thank God you didn't stop. Thank God you decided to write even as late as you did. And, and the fact that you took all of these, I literally have one, two, three, four. You've got four different, you know, boot camps that I just wrote down as I was taking my notes. And I was like, God, no wonder his writing is so good because he keeps practicing and practicing and practicing. It's, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's, it, it, it's, it's funny, you know, cause I've, I'm a member of, of the HWA, which, which, which you had asked me about. And, um, so you, so I go to, I go to like all the sober cons and things like that. And, um, all the people my age there have been doing this forever. You know, they're all like, you know, like have won stokers. They've, they've like, like written 50 novels and all this shit. I hang out more with like the younger folks who are just like starting out. Cause I, I, it's 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 an odd space for me because all the people my age are very accomplished and I'm not. It's I had I had I never in my life did I think I would have an actual book from a publisher, especially a publisher as cool as Trepidatio and Journal Stone. Two years ago, I went to the first author con and I was like, God damn, man, I need to write, I need to write a book. And I just never got off my ass and did it, you know, because I, I wanted to put a collection together. So last year I went to AuthorCon and I was like, mother, sorry. I said, I'm going to I'm going to write, I'm going to put a collection together. So I went on Facebook and um, I just, I just did a, an accountability post. And I just told everyone that I am doing a collection. I said, I, nobody knows who I am. So it's, I'm going to self-publish it, but I don't care because I'm, I'm doing it. I'm tired of just being a, a noob and not having anything and then, and then someone, you know, Scarlett from Trepidatio wrote, and she goes, well, I'm, I'm interested. She goes, send it to me. I, you know, I won't make any promises. And I sent it to her. And a few weeks later, she read it. And she's like, yeah, we'll publish this. I'm like, what the fuck? So it's like, wow. So I have, so, so yeah. And, and I mean, they've, they've, they've published like really people I know that I look up to, like, you know, they published Gwendolyn's first book. They published books by Sarah Reed. They're doing Karina Bissett's new book, um, Lauren, uh, L.L. Souls, his book. And it's, it's like, fuck, Eric LaRocca, they did one of his books. And then, then there's fucking, sorry, sorry. Then there's me, you know, and it's just, it's so weird when I go to their, their webpage now and I see all these people, these big names, and then there's, there's my book. And I, I don't know that I'm ever going to get, used to that it just it's 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 so surreal to me that i have a book so <laughs> so i don't know that's very weird it's, no it's, it's, it's no weird. like your reaction it was like watching 
a kid just seeing your childish reaction and i don't mean childish in like a bad way it's more of that childish wonder that true joy like seeing how excited you got about that it just like it, it just made me so happy to see that you know what oh, i mean thank you. it's insane how happy this makes me when i got when i, I finally got my my contributors copy this week which was which was was pretty awesome i opened that first one i was like i just pick it up and i was like god damn man this is this is like a real thing. It's it's no longer, I, I, you know, you, it takes forever for a book to come out if you're not self-publishing. I think I signed the contract like last late spring, early summer. So it takes a long time, like, you know, for the formatting, the proofing, the cover and all that stuff. And then you just have to fit into their publishing schedule. And you're like, oh, and then it's finally out and you have it in your hand and you're like, wow, this is so cool. Now, I mean, I have enough stories to do another one. I mean, now I want to put another one out, but obviously this one just came out a few days ago. So I kind of not have to for a while. And seriously, my cheeks hurt. I'm so happy for you. Like massive congratulations. <laughs> so like that is just freaking awesome. So kudos to you for, like you said, finally putting yourself out there, having someone pick it up and then going through this whole process. And then, like you said, opening that box, there's nothing quite like that feeling. And so, like I said, oh, and to you. see your reaction. I do want to give a shout out to um, Don Noble, who did the cover. The cover is phenomenal. I am so happy with the way the cover turned out for this. So, Rooster Republic Press, that's where, that's where, that's Don's design company. So, not enough people give, give shout outs to their, to their cover designers, especially like now that all this AI bullshit is going on. Yeah. You know, I want a real cover designed by a real person. The one question I haven't asked you about is in regard to coffee, because you do mention coffee a couple times in your story. So, so my favorite question to ask is how much coffee in a day do you drink? And what is your go-to coffee? If you drink coffee. I drink, I don't drink as much coffee as I used to. I mean, I used to drink, oh my God, I used to drink like my first advertising job, my boss was a huge coffee nut. It, I would drink probably six, seven cups a day then and and lots of diet coke but i also had an hour drive each way to the job so you needed it and then one one job i had in columbus they actually they were such coffee nuts they actually had their own blend of of coffee we had like regular decaf and the agency blend and that was that was high test that that was phenomenal but but probably now i i probably drink three cups in the morning and and my favorite coffee is caribou which is, which is like a Midwest chain mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. started in, in, in Minneapolis. Um, but we used to be able to get caribou in the bag here in, 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 in Rockville. And it's really hard to find now. A lot of stores just quit carrying it. So a lot of times now we'll just end up buying Starbucks or Pete's. But just, just regular, regular. And then it has to, I used to put, I used to put sweet and low in it, but my wife got me off that. So now it's stevia and, and half and half. So which, which she says tastes disgusting, but you know, it, one time she actually she accidentally drank it. She said, what the fuck? You know, this is awful. Because she only wants, she only wants, you know, cream in hers. I just like, she said, you only need like a drop or two of stevie. And I put like a half a thing full of it in it. You know, it has, because that was another thing my mom got me going on when I was younger. She would let me have cold coffee. And it would just be like the coffee that was left in the thing. And I would dump like three or four spoons of sugar in it and a lot of milk. And then I would just drink it cold. And that was phenomenal. I was going to say, I was like, you were ahead of, you were ahead of the trend because, you know, <laughs> it, it wasn't necessarily cold brew, but we're going to call it cold yes. brew for, for, for lack of a better term right now. But, <laughs> and, and there was also, there's always a rule. I don't know about you, but there's, there's a rule in the house. If there's coffee left in the pot, you don't throw it out. I will drink it. Or if there's coffee left in my cup, don't throw it out. I will drink it. Those are the house rules. I will drink it if it's in the cup. But if I go to the pot, like a lot of times, like, you know, you don't make it until like that night when you're ready for bed and you set the, set the timer. So it comes on in the morning. There's something left in there. I'll go ahead and, and dump it. Yeah, but there's usually not anything left. But every now and then there's like, like a little bit. I'm, like, I'm going to drink in that now. It's like, you know, two o'clock in the morning. So. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. That's why, because I'm not having coffee with you right now. Because, I mean, I do want to stay up to to chat with you. But uh, I stopped myself at, I think, like two o'clock today. I was like, okay, I'm not going to have anything past two o'clock because I, I definitely need to sleep because I wake up early now to jump on the treadmill because I need to get myself back in shape. I, so. I, I could go to bed at, at seven o'clock at night and I could still not get up early. I hate the morning 
so much. So I usually, I usually, I, I will, I will make myself go to bed by two. Oh my God. You know, cause I just, I'm just always, I'm always up. I'm either reading or, or writing or just watching scary movies. Cause my, you know, my wife doesn't like a lot of the shows or movies that I like. So I will go downstairs after she goes to bed where I've got like, you know, the big TV and the surround sound and everything. And I can watch TV down here. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much a, a, a late night person. I, a night I, owl. Oh, Larry, my <laughs> cheeks are hurting. I I, th- I have had so much fun chatting with you and oh, talking me too. about thank your, you. your book. So thank you for hanging out and telling us your, your awesome stories and sharing yeah. with us your new book, baby. So congratulations on that. Thank you. It's it's called The Space Between. You can get it on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or at journalstone.com. If you, if you get it at Journalstone, they will also give you a free PDF. So you have the, the free ebook with it. The tagline for the show, go forth and be magical. I if know you- it. But you put me on the spot. My <laughs> mind is blank. I was like, shit, is it a uh, have a cup of coffee? No, it's go forth and be Ooh. magical. <laughs> I like that. Have a cup of coffee and go forth and be magical. Uh, no, that, that would be a mouthful. So, but. Too much. Yes. As if an you, ad writer, I could tell you that coffee, that, that, that tagline is too long. That's not going to work. No. Could you please send us off with the tagline? Go forth and be magical.